Certainly honored and excited to be here. If you get your Bibles this morning, we're engaging on a new series of teaching this quarter. Uh, this whole theme this year is God, period. And we spent the first quarter asking the question, is God real? And this quarter, we're going to spend time uh, dealing with this reality and talking about who is God. Certainly, we thank God for our ministers, uh, Pastor Connor and Pastor Mel, the pulpit, and Pastor Mitchell, and all of the ministers that appeal like, our deacons, and all of you children of our great God. It's just good to be here in the house of the Lord. And, and God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy this morning. And when you found the book of 1 Timothy, I would for the benefit of brevity and the sake of our subject as we talk this morning from the theme, Who is God? I want to look at that 17th verse and uh, hang my hat there this morning on it homiletically, the 17th verse of 1 Timothy chapter 1. As we look at this theme, who is God? Listen to the word of God. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I said, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated in front of the Lord. I want to lift an unusual theme this morning. I solicit your prayers this morning. I want you to consider this theme this morning. The God of Abraham, Paul, and Nipsey Hussle. The God of Abraham, Paul, and Nipsey Hussle. Last Sunday, the media and hip-hop worlds were both profoundly affected and impacted by a tragedy. A tragedy being the death of a 33-year-old who grew up in the throes of gang culture in South Central Los Angeles surviving the immense challenges of his upbringing and gifted with a musical and lyrical talent. He took his life experiences to rap music and worked his way from obscurity to prominence. Since last Sunday, both aficionados and those with limited knowledge about the hip-hop culture have learned much about this fella, Nipsey Hussle. We've seen innumerable videos that have shown, in spite of his tough upbringing, that he's long had an intelligence, maturity, and a social consciousness well beyond his years. His desire to build community, promote black entrepreneurial endeavors, science, technology, engineering, and math opportunities for inner city youth, and provide employment and economic mobility to those who reside in within his community has been widely discussed and widely reported over the past seven days. He was even scheduled to meet with law enforcement to help reduce recent rise in gang murders that were occurring in Los Angeles. All this came to a screeching halt last Sunday afternoon as he went to his store there in Los Angeles, without his security, trying to help one of his friends who had just been recently released from prison after being incarcerated for 20 years. Went there in the spur of the moment to help that friend find clothes and be fed, and only to come to his demise by someone who felt disrespected by him because of that gentleman's inability to follow the codes of its day. And so last Sunday evening there in Los Angeles, Nipsey Hussle, along with two other persons in his entourage, were shot. Nipsey died a little while later. And over the past week, Nipsey has been one who has reached seemingly legendary status. By some, he's been called the Tupac Shakur of his generation. While he may not have 
produced exactly what Tupac produced in terms of music and film. His contributions to his community have put him in a league of his own. People all over the world have lauded his works, rallies and, and marches have occurred in major cities all over the United States since last week to honor and to convey respect to what he was trying to do in his community. And I see, I can tell by the silence that some of you may be asking this morning, why would you preface a sermon in the church with a secular rapper who had a gang affiliation? Why in a sacred setting would you include the hip hop genre in the introduction of your sermon? Why, why, why would you use the life and music of someone who came up in the streets? Why, why would you put that? We didn't come to hear about that. We came to hear about God and sacred and spiritual things. We didn't come to hear about nips and hustle. We came to hear about Jesus. I know that's what some of you are saying because I know that's how the saints think, particularly those who have been focused and caught up in a particular religious and philosophical and theological presupposition. I hear what you're saying. And the reality is that many of us don't understand that while his music, while his language, while his life, you might think it was secular. I want to suggest this morning that his work was holy. There's a difference why, that's an extreme reason why young people all over the world have been affected by what he did. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen too many people marching across the United States thanking God for their churches. I haven't seen anybody hold one rally in Los Angeles or L.A. Or, 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 or Philadelphia or New York about their preaching and the work that that particular church was doing. So you've got to ask yourself the question, what was it about Nipsey Hussle that has had so many people affected and impacted by his death, from, from athletes to entertainers to entrepreneurs to folk to celebrities to common people. What is it about him uh, that through his death he's been introduced and there's so many characteristics and attributes about his life? What is it about his life that's worthy of such celebration? We didn't, we didn't see this type of celebration when, when Biggie Smalls and Tupac died. What is, what is about his core that has brought such imitation and his work that has brought such adulation. You know, I was trying to figure out what is it about this whole thing that seems holy, that seems a certain righteousness, even in his raw and uh, raw authenticity and, and being who he was and not trying to be anything different. It's, it was something seemingly holy about the nature of what he was doing. And I was, as I was pondering the impact that I haven't seen anybody have on our culture in their death like this at the age of 33, someone who was relatively unknown to many of us a week ago. has been on the news every single day. What is it? And it was in that context that God sent me a pneumatological facsimile. And right there as I was thinking about it, the Holy Spirit said last Sunday millions didn't know who Nipsey Hussle was. But over the past seven days, you've heard about his work. You've seen innumerable videos. You've found out about his attributes and characteristics. And because of that, that he's worthy, his life is worthy of celebration. But last week, while many people didn't know who Nipsey was, the Holy Spirit said to me that a week later, many people still don't know who God is. They, they don't know who God is, and God is not being celebrated because many people have no idea, like a week ago, they didn't know who Nipsey was, they don't know who God is. And so what I want you to do today, since the world has taken seven days to clearly introduce you to who Nipsey Hussle was, this morning I want you to take a moment to introduce people to the God, to the creator of not only the universe, but the creator of Nipsey Hussle and the creator of every child of God. Maybe one reason many of us won't celebrate God, won't rally for God. People are listening to Nipsey's music. People are celebrating his name. People are getting tattoos on their anatomy to memorialize his life. Well, why aren't as many people listening to God's music? How many people have gotten tattoos with G-O-D or the Most High on their anatomy since last week? Maybe it's because we've done a poor job 
in introducing the world to who God is. We've, we've shown them our religiosity. We've shown them our church. We've shown them our tradition. We've shown them our subjective ideologies. But have we done a decent job in introducing the world to who our God really is? And so St. Paul in our text this morning says the same way that the world and the media has shown you who Nipsey Hussle was, let me show you who God is. Paul writes in this book of 1 Timothy, perhaps on his fourth missionary journey. He writes to his young mentee, Timothy, and it's interesting why he wrote to Timothy. You see some similarities between what Paul was saying to Timothy and what Nipsey was trying to do in his community. First of all, you understand that Paul wrote to Timothy trying to get Timothy, trying to instill upon Timothy the desire and the priority to have a care for the community there in Ephesus. Not only was he trying to introduce care for the community there in Ephesus, but he was also trying to get Timothy to organize and manage the affairs of those who were connected to the Ephesian church there in Ephesus. He was trying to get him to have a care for the community, trying to organize and manage affairs. He also was trying to get Timothy to understand the importance of protecting the community from those who sought to do danger in the community. Y'all not going to help me preach here. Uh, for at the time of this text, the Gnostics were bringing about heretical teaching, trying to get those young Christian believers to no longer believe that Jesus came and died and lived. This teaching of Gnosticism was a threat to the church. And just like Nipsey didn't want in his culture a snitch in his community, uh, Paul didn't want the Gnostics to take over in his community. And so he's trying to get him to ward off Gnosticism and Docetism and Serentianism so the people in Ephesus could understand the importance of keeping God first and not letting Christ be polluted by any outside agenda. He was also trying to encourage Timothy to let Timothy know that in all probability he would not make it back to Ephesus. It is amazing that Paul was trying to say to Timothy, Timothy, although I started great work there in Ephesus, in all likelihood, I won't be back in Ephesus. The seeds that I planted there in Ephesus, Paul seemingly says to Timothy, Timothy, do me a favor. Would you please finish what I started? Uh, seemingly I can hear Nipsey Hussle speak through the annals of, 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 of history and time. Now, the work that I started there in South Central, I won't be back in the flesh to finish it, but can somebody please finish the marathon? As a matter of fact, he only had his own clothing store called Marathon. He was trying to build uh, uh, an industry and houses so that could be black entrepreneurship all through that, trying to buy back his community and bring something positive out of that community. And he used the word Marathon. It is interesting, that's the same word Paul uses. When Paul says, I want you to lay aside every sin and wait that does so easily beset us and let us run this race. That race in Greek is the word agon, where we get the English word marathon from. It's an agonizing race. Both, both Nipsey and both Paul understood that the walk and the priority and life were not sprints, but a journey was going to be on a marathon. I wish y'all helped me here. And so at the time of this text, Paul wants Timothy to know, I won't be back. But don't allow my absence to prevent, pre prevent and prohibit you from getting the work done. There are some more rappers uh, that got way more money than I have. There are some athletes who have way more money than I have. There are some uh, people who are affluent that have way more than what I have. Don't you just get so caught up in enjoying your lifestyle and enjoying your newfound success that you forget about the folk in the hood. I wish I had a witness. That's, that's a good word for us this morning. That maybe well, many of us don't have the money that Nipsey Hussle has. Maybe many of us don't have the claim and the prestige that Nipsey has. But I know you're now enjoying life on the east side, in Stone Mountain, in Lithonia. You made it like the Jefferson on up. You're moving on up. But while you move on up, don't you forget there are some folk, not in South Central, but South DeKalb, in the bank heads of life, who need somebody to reach back and to lend a helper if I can help somebody. As I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I can show somebody that he or she is traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, don't allow my absence to stop you from completing the work. Just like Eric Holder took out Nipsey with the bullet. One day Nero is going to take me out by his chopping block. 
He's going to be behead. He's going to behead me. But don't allow my death to stop you from empowering and having care for your local communities. Paul said, let me tell you something. Nips and I are a lot alike. For he, he grew up in the gang culture there in South Central L.A. That he grew up being a crip from the rolling 60s. He tell me, let me tell you, I grew up with a gang affiliation. Yeah, it, you, don't, you don't think as a gang, that's really what it was. I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm a member of the Pharisaic party. This gang which had arisen in the early 2nd century B.C. to protest the fact that military leaders had been nominated as the high priest. I was a part of that group that believed in a strict adherence to the law, the Pentateuch, the Mishnah, and the Torah. I was a Pharisee. I was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, but it was nothing but a religious gang. Let me tell you how gangish I was. One day I heard about this new movement called the way as a lad, as a part of my initiation. They told me we're going to take out a deacon of the church called Stephen or called Stephen. And we don't need you to shoot the bullet. We don't need you to throw the rocks. You just hold our coats and be our metro D and holler out 5-0 in case somebody comes who has more power than we do. And so as a young lad, I was a gang, I was gang affiliated. I, I held the coast of those who threw rocks at Deacon Stephen. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. In Acts chapter 7, I watched him as he died. And after I got initiated into this Jewish gang, this Pharisee gang, I rose up the ranks real quickly. I, you thought the rolling 60 was something. You should have seen my gang. I got letters from the high priest. I secured letters to go to Damascus to lock up anybody who the part of this movement called the way. Oh, my God, the Crips and the Bloods didn't have nothing on me because I had religious and political support in my gang to eliminate anybody who believed in this field preacher from Galilee. I was riding a I had every gang sign imaginable I had chariots I had horsemen I had I, I, I had the complicity of the government I was going to lock up the saints and on my way to Damascus in another territory something happened to me the same thing happened to Nips I had an epiphany I had a theophanous moment on my way to Damascus the Lord showed up in a bright light knocked me off my horse and said Saul Saul why are you persecuting me at that moment he said I changed from my gang affiliation I, I changed from being a hell raiser to a heaven praiser I changed tribe I spent the rest of my life Not working against Jesus, but trying to build up community. I then became an ambassador for Christ. But, but like Nipsey, like some of you, I can relate to Nipsey. Because when you change, sometimes people don't have the tendency to see you in their change. Sometimes even the church folk are the most notorious for keeping you stuck in where they saw you initially. Y'all ain't feeling me here. You, you can't receive me because of my tattoos. You can't receive me because of the teardrops under my eyes. You keep me reduced and relegated to where you found me. But Paul said, but don't get it twisted. Nips ain't the only somebody who's got a past. When you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, he said, let me tell you, let me cut through the chase for some of you holy highfalutin folk. Some of you folk who come on 7.30 in the morning like you're doing God a favor, making us think because you're here early that you always been up and coherent at 7.30 on a Sunday morning. Let me just cut through the chase because I know that ain't the truth. Uh -huh, look at y'all looking at me now. Yeah, I know some of y'all enjoying this service. Now, I know some of you don't have the smell of alcohol coming from your pores now, but let's be real. You ain't always been in church at 7.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So don't look at the nipses and the paws of life because of where we were. A am I right or am I wrong about it? As the truth be told, some of us have had some Paul and nipsy moments uh, since you've been saved. I wish I had a witness. And no wonder they called him Nip. Uh, well, I'm from the old folks. I need to go get me a little Nip. Uh, I wish I had a witness. Some of y'all know something about a little Nip. There's some Nips in all of us. Am I right or am I wrong about it? All of us. There's some good in the best of us. That, 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 there's some good in the worst of us. And some bad in the best of us. And Paul said, let me tell you, don't get it twisted. I ain't always been where I am now. I've not always qualified to tell anybody anything about spiritual things. So let me tell you a little bit of my past resume. He said, I thank God who has enabled me. 
counted me faithful, put me in the ministry. Uh, look, look, let me, let me, let's look at that in the Message Bible. It makes a little more Nipsey-like language. I like how he puts it in the Message Bible right here. Same verse. Look what he said. He said, let me tell you who I was. He said, oh, he said, for I'm grateful, Jesus, for making me adequate to do this work. He went out on a limb, trusted me with this ministry. He said, listen, I didn't have no credentials. Nothing but street credentials. I don't have no witness here. He says, I was effective. He said, I didn't have nothing but witch hunts and arrogance. Kill folk. He said, but I was treated. Lord, have mercy. Don't y'all make me tear this church up. I, I had a jacked up past. I was tore up from the floor up. But in spite of my past, I was treated mercifully. Is there anybody around this house doing a thing about mercy? Ah, mercy. Oh, folks, that soothes my case. I was treated mercifully. Why, Paul? Because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who I was doing it against. I, it was just the culture I came up in. We got to be careful that we don't condemn young folks for their lives because of the context from which they came. Come on, help me. We all are products of our environment. And sometimes you can't do better if you don't know better. Oh, but isn't it wonderful that one day when the law introduces himself to you, that he can break beyond the parameters of unhealthy cultures and change your life and meet you with grace and brand new favor. He said, he said listen, y'all, I was messed up. I, I was tore up. He said, it was grace mixed with faith. Lord have mercy. Grace mixed with faith and love poured all over me. It was all because of Jesus. He said, yeah, yeah don't, don't y'all look at Nipsey like he's the only one. Had some pass. Many of, us, many of us got tattoos. They're just not on your body. They're on your soul. Come on. A tattoo ain't nothing but a reminder of something. I wish I had witnessed that. A lot of us got some mental tattoos. We got some relational tattoos. Many of us. He said, this is my reality. I, I, I had a hard time like Nipsey. My life was not always what you think it should be. But God gave me a higher call. Let me tell you something. Nipsey Hussle's work is more respectable to me than 80% of our churches in Atlanta. Because he used what he had, not for himself but trying to make a difference in the life of somebody. Y'all got, got the brakes on me here. When we make it about ourselves, but you missed it because his name wasn't Rev. You missed it because he used some profanity every now and then. But it's strange that you can read Peter but can't read Nipsey. Ain't no difference between, ain't no difference between the two. Huh? Y'all ain't feeling me here. Nipsey carried a nine, Peter carried a switchblade. Ain't no difference between them. Huh? Nipsey used profanity. Paul cussed some, a uh, 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 Peter cussed somebody out. Ain't much difference, and the truth be told, ain't much difference between us. I know you say, but you ain't forgot how to cuss. I know you say, but it don't take one moment. You you go, you reach for your knock, your Glock, and your nine. You go Taekwondo on a Negro right now if they press your buttons. Am I am I talking to anybody? You ain't forgot how to slap somebody they get wrong and get in your face. I mean, God is still working on some parts. Many of us, some of us ain't never re reformed thugs and thuggets. Uh, who if it had not been for the great, am I talking to anybody around here? But the same God who made us, the same God who made Nipsey. Same God who gave Paul a call, gave Nipsey a charge. He wasn't reverend, he wasn't bishop, he wasn't doctor, he wasn't apostle, and that's the problem. We've gotten so caught up with titles. It ain't about your title, it's about your testimony. It ain't about where you sit, it's about where you sit. Paul said, now, that's enough about me. I, but I want you to leave here knowing a lot about Nipsey and Paul and not knowing nothing about God. So, so today, let me introduce you to the God. L let me show you not Nipsey's attributes or characteristics. Let me show you some of God's characteristics. That maybe once you learn more about God, you can celebrate him and start playing his music. 
Maybe you can have some rallies in his name. Y'all ain't feeling me here. Maybe, maybe we can get Kodak Black and T.I. and Snoop and others to talk more about God. Can, have we introduced people to God? Celebrate Nipsey's life. It's worth of celebration. Emulate his activities. They're worthy of emulation. He empowered the community. But let me tell you about God. Paul said the reason why I'm here is because there's a God. So you ask the question, church, who is God? He said, let me give you four attributes of God. The first attribute, Paul says, I want to give you about God. Just four things. I take my seat. He says, and nobody has these attributes. Says, Number one, God is, here it is, immutable. Can the church say immutable? Uh, I I immutable is the first attribute. Look what he said in verse 17. Now <laughs> unto the king. Lord have mercy. I, please help me, Holy Ghost. Now unto the king. Here's that word, y'all. Now unto the king eternal. Stop right there. What, what, does the, what does immutable mean? What does immutable mean? Immutable means eternal. It means unchanging. It means over time, unable to be changed. Immutable means never inconsistent. I said never inconsistent. You ever dealt with some inconsistent people in your life? I want you to go to your job tomorrow and find every inconsistent person and say, I speak immutability over your life. I wish I had a witness here. You, you ever dated somebody inconsistent, got some inconsistent family and friends, but God here, never inconsistent. I like this. Immutable means never growing. Lord, have mercy. Uh, God does not have to grow. Y'all quiet here. You and I have to grow. We all leave room for each other to grow. But God is immutable. Ooh. Never growing. Never inconsistent. Never developing. Never processing. I'm sorry, Alfred North Whitehead, the great proponent who taught that God is a God of process. He called it process theology. That we have to be patient with God. Because God is always in the process of becoming. Uh, we, after North Whitehead says in process theology that we got to take our time, the problems with this world are that God has not fully matured yet. And that's why it's crazy. It's because God is still processing. God is still developing. He was trying to help God out by saying that you and I need to understand that God is like us, that God needs some more time to process. And so while God is processing, one day God's going to be what we want God to be. But in the meantime, be patient with God. Because God is not through with God's self yet. Because God is still developing, still growing. The problem that Alpha North Whitehead had in process theologians is they, they were looking at uh, uh, how the world changes. Lord have mercy. When I was a boy, my mama and my grandma we used to watch a, uh, a soap opera called, they called it The Stories. One was called The Young and the Restless. Bold and the beautiful. Uh-huh. Y'all remember Young and Arrested, Miss Chancellor and Victor Newman. I wish I had a witness here. Uh, they had one called Bold and Beautiful. They had another one called God and Light. Then they had one called As the World. Uh-huh. I ain't by myself. I wish I had a witness. Yeah, As the World Turns. The problem with us is as the world turns. It makes us wonder, is God turning? Is God developing? Because they didn't understand that there's a difference between God's essence and God's energies. Are y'all with me here? Uh, what, what you're trying to say, do it, Smith. What I'm trying to say to you is here is how God operates may change. That's God's energies. Uh, who God chooses to use may change. That's God's energies. Same God that used the judges can come back and use the kings. Same God that used the kings can come back and use the prophets. Same God that used the prophets can come back and use uh, the queens. Same God that used the queens can come back and use uh, the disciples. Same God that used the apostles can come back and use the disciples. God, who God uses can change. Are y'all with me here? 
Uh, he can be a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Have the ark of the covenant in the Old Testament. Have a tabernacle or tent in the Old Testament. Turn around and have a synagogue or a temple in the New Testament and a church in the 21st century. What God does can change. He can use a donkey for Balaam. can use a rooster. Y'all ain't feeling me here. For Peter, what God does can change. He can send you to a brook in 2018 and dry the brook up in 2021. 20, 20, what God does can change. He can be the God of Eden for Adam. He can be the God of Gethsemane for Jesus. What God does can change. But who God is. Oh, you don't hear me. Who God is is unchanging. You can depend on the character of God. Although the unfolding revelation of God's plan can connote and denote change. Ah, because we see it through a human lens. But the eternal plan of God remains the same. Come in right the Hebrews. Jesus is the same. When do it? Yesterday. Today. And forevermore. So do how you got saved. Yesterday I got saved. It was Jesus. Today, when you get saved, it'll be Jesus. And next year, when you get saved, guess who it's going to be? Somebody say, immutable, immutable. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's immutable, it's immutable. He, God won't change on you. He won't be your friend when you're in the hood and get jealous when you get on your elevation. Immutable. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's not like your friends celebrate you as long as you got money, but turn their back on you when you're down. God, immutable. And not only is God, who is God? God is immutable. Second thing I want to tell you about God, God is immortal. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed by the text here this morning. It's right here in the text. He said, now unto the king. <laughs> uh, eternal. Can I break it down? Now unto the king who is immutable. But secondly, the king who is immortal. Stop that for a second. Immortal. The I am, the prefix, is a negation of the suffix. Are you with me here? The I am in front of the verb or the noun. Not only negates it, but shifts it. Whatever comes after it <laughs> shifts. When I am Gets before. Y'all ain't feeling me here. The suffix there is mortal. The prefix on mortal is mort. M-O-R-T. Mort. That's the prefix. When, if you look at your thesaurus, your dictionary, whenever you see the word mort as a prefix, M-O-R-T, you can automatically, 99% of the time, assume death. It's associated with the, with the prefix mort. Huh? Can I break it down for you? Uh-huh. Mortuary. M-O-R-T. See, there's a difference between mortuary and sanctuary. And every Sunday when you show up for church, those two characteristics are prevalent in every congregation. Some folks come to the mortuary. Some folks come to the sanctuary. Y'all quiet. Matter of fact, when I look around this place this morning, some of y'all look like you belong in the mortuary. Of you look like you came to be in the sanctuary. You can tell sanctuary folk because they don't mind lifting their hands and saying thank you Jesus or hallelujah, but mortuary folk came ready to be embalmed. Is there any sanctuary people in this house this morning that came to lift up the name of Jesus? He says, mortuary, that's a house of dead folk. Uh, let me come this way. You ever heard the word mortician? You've heard the word beautician? Uh, Y'all gonna help me preach here. You've heard the word physician? Y'all ain't gonna help me preach here. A physician works on the bodies of, of, of folks who are sick. A beautician. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. Helps to beautify what you bring to a table. But when a mortician gets involved. Mortician is an individual who works with dead folk. 
mortgage. That means you're going to have that thing till you're dead. I wish I had a witness right now. 30, 40 years, you still going to have it. Am I talking to anybody in this place this morning? But notice what Paul said here, that our God is not only immutable, but our God is immortal. That I am before mortal negates mortal. Whenever you put I am in front of what comes next, it shifts it. Paul didn't say God was mortal. That means he's subject to death. Paul says he is immortal. Meaning bullets can't kill it. Fire can't burn it. Water can't drown it. He's I am. Okay, y'all ain't going to help me here. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me come this way. Maybe, maybe you've never heard of the I am. It's a prefix for I am. Yeah, I am in English. I apostrophe M. That's a, that, that's, that's, that, that's a derivative of I am. I apostrophe M. I am. Whenever you put I am. Y'all missing me. Y'all slow here. Okay, let me come this way. When Moses asked God, who should I tell Pharaoh? sent me to tell Pharaoh uh, to let my people go. Moses said, don't get deep. God said, don't get deep, Moses. Just tell him, I am. Sent me. Uh, Jesus told me to tell you, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man come to the Father except you come by me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. I am the good shepherd. And my sheep know my voice. I am the light of the world. Oh, you don't hear me. I came to tell you, I don't care what's in your life. Won't you put I am in front of it? And if you put I am in front of it, it'll turn it. Look at your bills. And before your bills, just write I am. Look at your depression in front of your depression, right? I am. And I am will shift everything that come behind it. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche, German theologian, wrote during a time of enlightenment and rationalism, looking at uh, the culture of his day. And Frederick Nietzsche posited that God was dead. Uh, not because Nietzsche necessarily felt that God literally had died a physical, tangible death, but he felt because the rationalism and enlightenment, the people's mentality and milieu had killed God. In this 21st century, people act like God is still dead. Don't come to church, not committed to ministry, not faithful, live by no code, no creed. You would think, look at us of our lives, that God is dead. But the God ain't dead. Come here, Joe Lagon. Come here, mighty clouds of joy. Joe Lagon said, let me ask you a question. If God is dead, what makes the flowers bloom. Y'all in here. If God is dead, what makes summer come in June? If God is dead, who listens and who answers prayer? I'm glad I know he lives. Y'all ain't feeling me. If God is dead, Ah, who can mend a broken heart? Y'all quiet on me here. If God is dead, what keeps night and day apart? If God is dead, who can tell me where his body lies? I'm glad. No, y'all forget. Please don't do that. God, 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 who is he? Y'all take this. He, he's, he's, he's immutable. Uh, who is he? He's immortal. Who else is he? Uh, Paul told him to tell you he is invisible. I'm really embarrassed by the text this morning. I just want to uh, do a little sermonic surgery on this text. Listen to what he said. Now unto the king. Immutable. 
meaning eternal. Immortal, meaning he's not subject to death. Then he says, invisible. Hmm. Pause that for a second. He's invisible. And that's the problem with belief in God. Because many suggest that since God can't be observed by the five senses, God can't be put in a crucible of experimentation and investigation. Can't put God in a chemistry lab. Uh, can't find him on the scientific charts or tape. Uh, there is no algebraic formula, geometric equation. Talk about God. You, you can talk about water being H2O versus God's knowability. Every day we stand on a razor's edge between the incomprehensibility and the knowability of God. And because some things about God are incomprehensible, it puts us in a precarious predicament because if somebody asks you to show me God, it's hard to objectively and scientifically show proof of God. That's why Rudolf Otto suggested that when it comes about God, sometimes you have to use this word, this Latin phrase. He called it the uh, mysterium tremendum. Are y'all with me here? Uh, the mysterium tremendum. And what, what Otto was trying to say is when you talk about God, y'all say, say mysterium tremendum. Uh, uh, Otto was trying to suggest to us that some things about God, though they are uh, invisible, hard to explain. There are some inspiring moments. There are some arousing spiritual, religious, emotional moments that Otto calls numinous. These numinous moments evoke the mysterium tremendum. It is amazing here because these are the non-rational, non-sensory it's an experience or a feeling Woo! that you can always articulate to people. Uh, uh, Otto said there are some things we experience with this holy other. That at moments it can't be reduced, it can't be defined, it can't be taught. It's a non-sensory feeling. It is an unfathomable mystery. It is an unexplainable connection and that's what you got to understand that some things about God are invisible to the natural carnal mind oh, God. some things my God help me Holy Ghost sometimes you got to discern it by the spirit uh, I can't explain scientifically how it is some Sunday mornings. I get up and don't feel my bed. But as soon as I walk in the sanctuary, I hear the deacon saying, just one more time, just one more time, I'm glad to be in the number. And the same folk who saw you not feeling well before you got in, they say, what happened to you when you was in there? Did you take a Tylenol? No. Advil? No. Shock? No. Blood pressure come down? No. Well, what was it? I ain't got no help around here. Y'all, I, I wish I could explain it to you. Sometime when I was depressed and going through something, and some said to me, I'm going to read my Bible. And I just picked my Bible up and turned it. And the place where it landed. Well, I wish to see, see, I, see if, if, everybody can identify because you ain't never pick your Bible up. But that's a folk right here that picked your Bible up and exactly what you were going through. Am I talking to anybody around here? You can't put it in a scientific expression or equation. What is that doing? That's the mysterium tremendum. What is it that makes you cry? 
folks say you're sad. No. What is it that sometimes when you're riding in your car and your favorite song come on the radio and all of a sudden you start getting cheer bumps? You ain't cold. You ain't hot. I wish I had somebody who knew what I was talking about. There is an invisible force and power that's unexplainable. My cousin Calvin said it like this. What is this that make me feel good inside? What is this that make me want to run on anyhow? Whatever it is. It just won't let me hold my peace. Wish that's my old folk here. It makes me love my enemies. It makes me love my friends. And it won't let me be ashamed to tell the world I've been. Is there anybody who can testify? I know what you're talking about, do it. Uh, I can't, I, you can't always see it, but, but it's there. God moves. Somebody said in a mysterious way. Huh? Some of us, that's the problem with atheists. I'm, I'm finished. I don't believe in God. Can't investigate God. Can't put God in a laboratory. Can't put God in a crucible of experimentation and investigation. Y'all with me here? A woman and a husband got married when they both were unsaved. They got married, they were unsaved. And that woman found the Lord about five years after they got married. That woman got saved, but her husband refused to give his life to Christ. Creating problems in their marriage because the woman wanted to go to church and wanted to tithe. Her husband felt she had no place doing that. Be quiet. Let me run the house and stop taking my money to church. And she said, no, I'm putting God first. She sang around the house and get happy and start crying. He said, what you crying about? That's my song. You cried about a song. You're just too emotional. Don't make no sense. Fought for years. What you crying about? You just don't know how I feel. What you feel? I can't tell you what I feel. I wish I had the woman I married. Because you feel you're acting different. What's your problem? I just feel different. You're too emotional. You're going by your feelings. God ain't about no feelings. Go tell our marriage you. Talk about what you feel. You can't even explain what you feel. God on the inside, show him to me. I can't show him to you. He's invisible. You're going to tear our marriage up because of something that's invisible. You can't see it. They fought about seven years in their marriage. And then one day, middle of the night, about three o'clock in the morning, their husband bust out hollering, crying. Ah! 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 Wife woke up, woke up on him shovel and saying, what's wrong with you? He said, it's Messiah. He didn't know unbeknownst to him, his appendix had burst. Ah! ah. Why say, tell me what it feel like. I can't explain. <laughs> tell me what's wrong with you. Show me where it's hurt. I can't see it. She said, well, I'm going to take it to the doctor, but that's exactly how I feel sometimes. When I'm connected with God, he puts something on the inside. I can't explain it. God knows I can feel it. Who is he, y'all? Oh, he's immutable. He's, oh, God, he is immortal. He is invisible. I got time for one more thing. Can I tell you one more last thing? Who, not only is he immutable, not only is he invisible, not only is he immortal, but for the Paul says, who is God? He's intelligent. I'm, I'm going to quit right here. He's intelligent. Now, unto the king. <laughs> he's immutable. That means he's eternal. He's immortal. That means he's not subject to death. Invisible. This mysterium tremendum. This holy other. Ah, sometimes can't be ascertained with the natural senses. Got to be understood by, oh God, a spiritual man. Uh, he's invisible. You know what? The wind is invisible. Somebody say, I see the wind blowing. No, you didn't.
No, you never saw the wind blowing. You saw leaves moving. You saw trees swing. You didn't see the wind. You saw the evidence of the wind's momentum. When you lift my hands, you may not see the spirit, but you see the evidence. Oh, God, he's invisible, but then he's in trouble. Now the king, immutable, immortal, invisible. Here it is, intelligent. The only... Wise God. I got, I got to finish here, but uh, I'm, if I'm finishing here, it's interesting. Look at that. Verse 17 is what those who've done linguistic analysis on this word would call it a doxology. Yeah, when I was a boy in church, we had programs and printed programs. With the announcements in it. Now you have the prelude. Yeah, with me here, you have uh, the processional. Uh -huh. that's, that's when the choir would march down the aisle. It's called the procession. Am I talking right to anybody? Then sometimes on the program, you have what we're called the invocation. Now that, that meant when you invoke the presence of God. Now, sometimes black folk, they know that meant they're praying about the offering and praying about, no, it's the invocation. It's the, that's what the altar call, y'all know, it's the, the invocation just to open the service. I'm, just, I'm still teaching uh, while I'm being funny, amen? It's the invocation. Uh, are y'all with me here? Then, then we have something called the responsive read. I wish I had some folk who grew up in church like me. Huh? Uh, then you have the morning hymn. Then we have the altar call. They put the words of the hymns in the program. Y'all with me? A hymn for 54, a charge to keep our hat. Uh, a God to glorify. Uh, I remember the altar call. My daddy was saying, come ye disconsolate. Where ye language? Come to the mercy seat. Fervently near. Here, bring your wounded heart. I feel the Holy Ghost. Here, tell your anguish. Earth has no sorrow. Well, we got to go back to the hymn. That heaven cannot hear. Well, you don't hear me. Uh, we have the pre-sermon selection. We have uh, the sermon, the word of God. Then we have the, the invitation to discipleship. We have the Gloria Petra. Y'all ain't feeling me here. We have the offertory chant. All things come of thee, O oh Lord. I wish I had a witness right here. And then we get ready to go home with the doxology and the benediction. Am I talking to anybody who remember that? Uh-huh. Have the sick and shut in and the announcements on the back. I miss those days sometimes, but it costs too much money because folks don't read it. They write out, let the kids play all in it. Y'all ain't feeling nothing here. Cause it's time of the week for people to play around with the program. But when you got to the doxology, the doxos logos in Greek, it's a word of expression of glory to the one that we worship, the doxology. The doxology was always the last thing on the program. Y'all feeling me here? And so in a real sense, verse 17 is a doxological conversation. It's supposed to be at the end of the chapter. But for some reason or another, Paul here breaks proper linguistic protocol. When the doxology should be the last verse, Paul said, I messed up, I messed up and had a nipsy moment. I thought about where I was before he found me. And I made the mistake of talking about him prematurely. And when I think about God, y'all forgive me if I mess up your protocol. Uh, when I think about where God found me, I got to stop in the middle of chapter 
chapter 1 and engage in a doxological discourse and say, Now unto the king. Is that anybody? You ain't got to wait to the end of the program to give God your shout. You ain't got to wait till the organ come on. You can stop right now in the middle of the service and throw your hands up and shout, Hallelujah! I'm finished. I, I'm finished. I didn't mean to hold y'all this long, but he, he, he's, he's immutable. He's immortal. He's invisible, but he's also intelligent. What you mean, do it? The only. The only. Wise. Go. Uh, meaning that our God has faculties. It's an anthropomorphic term to let us know that God is not a smart God. That the difference between smart and wise. A whole lot of smart folk ain't got no wisdom. You, you can get smarts from college. But you could be a third grade dropout. I wish I had a witness here and have some wisdom. Some stuff you get in school. Some stuff you get, ah, uh, Lord, how much? In the streets. And some stuff you get when you're on bending knee. Boy, I, I, boy, I better quit because I'm just, I'm just. He's so wise. <laughs> he ain't smart. He's more wise. See, uh, God is so wise, God is so intelligent that God lit the sun one time and it's never gone out. I've never been to a repair shop. That's intelligent. God is so wise that he put bulbs in the stars and I've called them the twinkle for billions of years. Y'all ain't feeling me here. That shows God's wisdom, God's intelligence. God, God is so wise that he put wetness in the water, whiteness in the snow, viscosity in the oil. He's intelligent. God is so wise. Put the sweetness in the orange, sour in the lemon. Y'all ain't feeling me here. I said God is so wise. Gave the dog this woof woof. Cow, it's me, y'all. Hyena, it's laugh. Y'all ain't feeling me. And the lion, his roar. He's so intelligent that God knows. Knows the beginning from the end. Boy, I wish I had time to preach it like I felt that. Can I tell you something? And I want to encourage you here. Many things about tomorrow may not understand but guess what I do know I know who's holding tomorrow God is so intelligent that he knows the number of hairs on your head if you bow he knew the hair how many hair follicles you used to have y'all ain't feeling me here Ah, uh, whether you growed it or you sold it, he knows the number of hairs on your head. He's intelligent. He, he knows what we need even before we ask. And this is why I give God glory. I'm finished. I don't have time to finish it. I, I want to praise God right now because I don't know what's going to happen the rest of April. I don't know what's going to happen in May or June. I don't know what's going to happen the rest of this quarter in the next 13 weeks, but I'm, I rest assured I can sleep at night because my immutable God, while we are in April, is already living in June. And while God is in June, he's preparing us in April. So whatever you run into in life, 
God has already fixed it. Because God knows. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. None else can heal our souls' diseases. No, not one. Here, here's the verse I love. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He's intelligent. And he'll guide us to the day is done. Are y'all with me here? Can I give y'all my grandmama's hymn? My grandma Maddie was saying, we are our heavenly father's children. And he loves us, one and all. Yet there are times we find we'll answer another's voice and call. My grandma would love singing this song. But if we're willing, I remember hearing a soprano voice singing it at Beulah Baptist. If we're willing, the Lord will teach us. It is his voice only to obey. My grandma was saying, for he knows. And I'm glad he knows. What does it know, Maddie May? He knows just how much we can bear. My grandma came back. She'd been dead almost 10 years. But I can hear a voice. He knows just how much you can bear. And when you think you can't take no more, my grandma, Maddie me, my Smith, told me to tell you, God is so intelligent that he knows just how much. When you think you're about to break and you're about to crumble, you think that God don't care, nothing about you. My grandma from her grave, crying out, he told me to tell you, he knows. So guess what? You and I ain't got to know because he knows. And if God knows, trust that God will. If he gets what you came back, God will get a little low with you. But you're going to make it. Don't you give up on God. Y'all stand. Y'all stand. Oh, have mercy.